Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Aquarium of the Pacific Online Academy. My name is Alicia. Now, today for our program, we're going to be exploring all about coral and the habitats that they build. Now, before we get started, I wanted to invite you to participate with us today. You can participate in a couple of different ways. Um, I'm not alone here in our studio. I have Ali, who's helping with our controls, and Miss Sarah, who's taking questions today. So if you have any questions, feel, please feel free to text us at 562-286-1838. If you're watching this after we've already aired live, please feel free to email us. You can see our, our email address here at the bottom. But you know, besides texting in, you can always write down your observations, your questions. You can share them with family members. Um, however, you can shout them out loud, however you would like to participate today, because we're going to be exploring. Now, when I say exploring, I mean, we are going to be making observations and thinking thoughtfully so that we have questions and maybe even puzzling out answers to our questions. So we're going to start by kind of making some general observations of a coral reef today. So a coral reef, like the one that we have behind me here, is a mix of living and non-living things. So as we watch here, do you recognize any of the, the animals? How do you think the environment would be? Let's say you were a scuba diver and you had a chance to swim through this habitat. What do you think it would be like? Hmm. How might you describe it? Oh, do you see those sharks? You actually can see two different kinds of sharks in here right now. So if you were to put on your wetsuit and all of your dive gear and jump on in, which would be wonderful, right? I don't know if it's hot where you are right now, but that sounds great. The water temperature is actually pretty nice. It's in the mid 70s, so the water is nice and warm. And when we think about a habitat, it's good to kind of think about, again, those non-living features as well. So the water temperature, even the chemistry of the water can play a role in how healthy a habitat can be. So looking at the water here, we can see that it's pretty clear. So it's warm, as we were to describe it. Now for some of the living elements in here, what do you notice? Do you notice that there's quite a few animals? Yeah, me too. So a coral reef happens to provide pretty much the necessities for many types of animals. And because those resources are really close together, they're kind of packed in, you have a lot of animals that can live really close together. If resources like in the deep sea are spread out, you know, if you were to go to the bottom of the ocean in the deepest parts, you may not see an animal for quite some time. And that's because where it finds its food, places to, um, to survive are kind of spread out. But a coral reef has the advantage of lots of things kind of close together. And the reason these animals can find these resources depends on a very special animal. Yeah, the coral, the coral itself. So let's talk first about the coral as an animal. So we have models of coral back here and talk about them um, and how they basically build this entire habitat, how all the animals here come to rely on that coral within their food webs. And then uh, we'll introduce some of these bigger animals. So I want to switch our view here and zoom in a little closer to um, one of our live coral habitats. And you can see, wow. <laughs> well, first of all, you know, we've changed our view. So we're pretty close. You know, this is like as if we were to stand right in front of it. Um, so I'm kind of in scale with our, our view here. So, you know, if I were to put my hand out, it would be pretty much the same size as some of the animals here. Whereas the last view, you know, I could swim through that big exhibit. So what are some things that you notice as we zoom in and take a look at the coral? Can you find the coral in here? Yeah, so there are different kinds of coral. So this is, you can see, if we look closely, which is really fascinating, coral comes in a lot of different shapes. Just like there are many different kinds of fish out there that come in different shapes, coral as an animal has there, there's lots of different types or species that are out there as well. So some of it is what we call a branching coral. Some of it is a little bit more flat or um, plate-like as they call it, like this one here. 
There's even um, soft coral, which is this stuff right over here. So what is coral? Coral is part of a group of animals called cnidarians. You may not recognize coral right away, but you might recognize some of their close cousins, which would be jelly, sea jellies, in fact, or jellyfish, as you might know them. Or, yeah, this is a cousin to coral. Isn't that crazy? Now, if we were to take that shape with these big tentacles and flip them upside down, we'd get their other cousin, which would be sea anemones. Pretty crazy. So this is another cousin here. Now, coral, the actual animal part to them, because there is a hard part to them as well, is like taking one of these sea anemones and shrinking them down. Ta-da! Thanks, Miss Allie. We're on good timing today. So, uh, so here is what we call a coral polyp. This is an individual here that uh, sticks out of a hard shell. So maybe you've seen what it looks like when a coral dies and leaves behind kind of that white shell, which we'll take a look at in just a moment. But these coral live in little holes that are part of this larger shell. So you can think of that sea anemone, again, shrink down, and to protect itself, as it grows, it, create, it secretes this hard calcium carbonate structure around it. So basically it's it's calcium, which is really, really thick. So calcium carbonate all the way around itself. And slowly, this animal will grow in its habitat and these little polyps stick out of it. So I wanted to show you, it's kind of like a big apartment complex. I wanted to show you that coral skeleton in comparison to kind of like the live animal view here to see what that looks like. So I'm gonna go over to my special document camera and I'm gonna turn this down just a, just a little bit here so we can kind of see some of those details. And you can see that the coral, again, come in many different shapes. So I just wanted to show you the um, bigger version before we zoom in here. So I'm gonna choose one of these. Again, we have these different shapes. So the animal itself has, has died. This is the skeleton. This is the outside skeleton or what we call an exoskeleton. Because they don't have a skeleton on the inside, they are invertebrates. If they were vertebrates like us, they would have a skeleton on the inside, but because they do not, they are invertebrates. Okay, so I'm gonna take this one piece here and we're gonna zoom on in so that we can see where exactly those coral polyps would live. I'm gonna let it zoom in. All right. Do you see all of these little holes here? Yeah, so this would be where each of those little corals, that polyp that looks like a little sea anemone, would live. And what's another really interesting thing that makes them all related is on those tentacles that we were looking at, they have stinging cells. Yeah, right? We kind of remember that when we think about a sea jelly, but we, I think, sometimes forget when we we're talking about an animal like a coral. So they stick their little tentacles out, and if they can catch something that touches them, they sting and bring that to their body. Now, coral, though, not only can they sting their food, they actually get more than 80% of their food from a partnership, a symbiotic relationship with another organism. You ready for this? Pretty cool. So not only do they have um, kind of this nice protection on them, but corals tend to face the sunlight coming in. They're in shallow areas around the world, so they're not too deep. And that's because they need that sunlight to feed a little friend. <laughs> so drifting in the water, there's tiny little algae. Algae, similar to plants, can use photosynthesis to make their own food. Photosynthesis is the process of using sunlight and converting it into sugars, which is food. And so algae can do that, plants can do that, they need that sunlight. So coral has the advantage of this nice, hard place to live that, that offers protection. So a coral can, that little polyp, can actually accept into its body, I know it's gonna get weird, but it's kind of cool, that little algae will kind of drift inside the body of, kind of like the tentacles actually, of the coral. And 
the coral can kind of like host the, the little algae. So the algae is getting sunlight and feeding its extra sugar, that food, to the coral. Now that partnership is so strong that over time, coral has really relied on that partnership. So the algae is like, woohoo, I get a free place to stay. It's kind of like, hey, can I live in your apartment complex here? I'm a chef, I'll make you some food. And coral's like, sure. And, you know, getting 80%, that's a lot to get, you know, those sugars. So even though they can capture their own food, I want you to remember that, you know, that partnership is really important for a coral reef. Now, although sometimes a polyp can have its own colors, when we, maybe uh, Miss Allie would go back to that live coral exhibit. The cool thing is the algae itself has a lot of color. Now there's um, a fancy science term for that algae. It's called a zooxanthellae. So it's a, zoo is animal, so it's an animal algae, basically that lives um, inside the coral. There are other algae that partner with different kinds of animals, and I always think that's really cool. Like there are some animals like giant clams that do the same thing. Uh, so that algae is just really good at making friends. <laughs> and so, they, again, have that really cool partnership where animals that can offer protection um, accept them. And uh, what's really interesting, though, is it, it doesn't necessarily mean it's permanent. If something disturbs the algae, they can actually leave the tissues of the coral. Um, so I think that's really fascinating. So as the coral is growing and new little polyps grow, it can accept more of the algae from its habitat. So it's really interesting. Uh, there are a lot of symbiotic relationships in places that have a lot of different animals together in these tight spaces. If you think of a, like a rainforest, there are symbiotic relationships. If you think about, um, again, these places that the habitat has a lot of different kinds of animals close together, you tend to find more of these partnerships. Uh, for example, remember those cousins we talked about, the sea anemone? Yeah, a lot of people recognize sea anemones because they have symbiotic partnerships with clownfish. Ta-da! So here's another member of that group with a very different kind of partner, the, the clownfish. Both of them are in, again, these nice warm tropical locations. So another way to look at this, if you were to move a sea anemone into a cold water habitat, things are a little spread out. And in fact, there is not a partnership between the clownfish or even any fish and anemones in our colder water, just that tropical. Again, the habitat really changes some of the interactions between the animals. So we'll, thank you, Miss Allie. So we'll go back to, um, again, those corals. Now, building a, a, a huge skeleton like this takes a long time. Some corals can grow maybe a half inch per year, and that's pretty fast. But many corals are growing very slowly. This allows them to really add structure and strength to their hard exoskeleton, again, that outside hard piece to them. Um, and if there was a, maybe a storm, it's a, you know, they're pretty hardy, but um, you know, it does take a long time. So there's kind of this cost benefit of having this nice hard shell. If um, any of the, the coral dies on the bottom, um, they just kind of keep reaching up. So you can kind of see, you know, there might've been some polyps here at the bottom. All those little polyps are all connected to the same stomach. <laughs> Isn't that kind of cool? So it's a colony of animals that share resources. And there's just lots of different kinds in here. This soft co coral that you see here um, is a little bit different. So instead of spending a lot of time building a really hard skeleton on the outside of their body, they have some support um, inside of them, or sorry, uh, yeah, a little bit, I say it's closer to the surface. It's not a skeleton again. Um, but it is some support on their body that is harder, but it's not as complicated as the hard coral. So it does give them some flexibility. You'll actually see them moving around in the current. So they can grow faster towards the sunlight um, and they can get bigger faster, but if there was a strong storm surge, they probably 
uh, wouldn't do as well. So, you know, some animals do better being very rigid and growing slower, and some do better because the chance of a storm maybe might not be as big of a problem for them. Let's talk a little bit about the animals that make their homes here in the coral reef now that we've introduced you to the coral itself. By the way, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of coral, which I think is really fascinating. Um, I want you to take a look at this little fish right here. <laughs> this is a type of surgeon fish, and I don't know if you noticed it, but it actually has a mouth that sticks out like this when it's swimming, and it has bristles on it. So this fish right here specifically lives around corals and actually cleans the, um, a different kind of algae that can settle on top of the coral, cleans it off. So this fish here is actually really important. It's one example of you know, these mid-sized fish that eat algae on the outside of the coral. A healthy reef has a lot of these little fish in it because if, you kind of think if algae grew, this is, a, this is different than our zooxanthellae partners. This is just a different kind of algae. If it grew on top, it could block the sunlight for those other algaes that live inside. And the coral wouldn't do as well. It wouldn't get um, that, those sugars that we talked about made from their partners. So having a little friend like this to go over and just <laughs> scrape and clean around the coral is really important. So a lot of these animals are in really close balance to make sure the coral reef stays very healthy. Some of these little fish in here um, like to eat the little invertebrates. So there's lots of little worms and crabs. Again, I'm using that invertebrate term. Again, that means animal without a backbone. So worms and crabs, those tiny little things that, believe it or not, would live. So if we were to zoom in even farther, we'd probably see even more animals living around this area. This is a nice shelter for animals. It's a nice nursery for animals. This hard skeleton, if you're a big predator, might not be easy to fit through. Let me introduce you to some fish. And I'm gonna have Miss Allie maybe pick a fish for us to talk about that could live in this habitat. Oh, look at that smile. Look at that smile. I can never beat that smile. Isn't that cool? This is a parrotfish. What do you notice that's interesting about this parrotfish? Yeah. Not only is it smiling, um, but it's smiling, <laughs> it's kind of weird. It looks like almost like human teeth, right? On the front of this fish, like you photoshopped it on a face swap or something. Um, but its teeth have fused together. So you can kind of see the teeth here looks like one block and then another. And <laughs> it has the same kind of approach down here. Allows it to have almost like a beak. And this animal loves to eat the algae that grows, as I was saying, on top of the coral. And, the, and that can be algae on live coral or dead coral, basically whatever's growing on top of the coral. So it swims around and it takes a nice big chunk. Now, it's also swallowing coral pieces. Now, that's really difficult to digest for any other animal, but the parrotfish is pretty cool. It has special parts in its throat that help it grind up that coral. And then its stomach will separate out the algae from which is now actually sand. Yeah. So yeah, it poops out sand. So in those really tropical places, some of that sand is processed by big schools of parrotfish. So new appreciation when you make a sand castle, right? I want you to think of, thanks parrotfish. Um, the other cool thing, which is also kind of gross, but it's awesome, is that at night, a parrotfish, to help protect itself, will blow a big mucus bubble all the way around its body. I know, I said the word mucus. And it protects it from maybe like parasites. So if you think about like, if you've ever had a cat or dog, you might give medication so they don't get ticks and fleas. There are equivalents in the ocean, and they can be really troublesome for, for animals. Parrotfish like to snuggle in to a little spot in the coral when they, when they rest. But they have this nice bubble around them, and that prevents parasites. It also makes it a little harder for predators to smell them. And in the morning, they just kind of swim out of it. Sometimes some of them eat it. It's kind of gross. Again, they're kind of in that cool, gross category. 
Um, I used to live in a place where I, I did get to snorkel and see parrotfish. Sometimes I went out really early in the morning and I would see these things float by. I had no idea that it was that big mucus sleeping bag basically from a parrotfish. I was very confused when seeing those on the reef, but now I know. I'm glad I never touched it. Okay, let's, let's talk about another animal. <laughs> Here's a fun one. Okay, so we saw the very colorful parrotfish. By the way, parrotfish can be just rainbows and rainbows of colors, and they can change colors during their lifetime. It's ac actually in hard to identify a parrotfish just by their colors. So you have to look very closely because they change as they, as they grow and be between the different types or species of parrotfish. Parrotfish had a beak-like mouth. What kind of mouth do we see here? Yeah, <laughs> this is very different. This is a very long mouth. This fish is also shaped different. The parrotfish had kind of a football shape. It's a little bit rounder. This fish, if it were to turn and face you, it would be very thin. And that is one way to help this fish navigate through some of those very tight spaces in a coral reef which is great if you're trying to evade a predator. So if a predator's chasing you, you can use your shape to kind of bend into these little pieces. What are some other things that you notice about this animal? What are some things that might be special? Yeah, did you notice any cool colors? So it has this, this flat shape, or the, what we call uh, a compressed shape this way. It has a long mouth to fit in it can eat those little uh, worms, those little invertebrates that are hiding be between the coral. Uh, get my words out. And then it also has these really cool stripes on its body. Um, so these, uh, sorry, bands as we call them. So if it's up and down, these are bands. If it's longwise, those are stripes. So this is a copper banded butterfly fish. And this one here is hiding where its true eye is located. That's because it's faking out a predator using a false eye spot. This is very confusing. If you're a predator and you wanna sneak up and grab your prey really quickly, you wanna grab its face so that it doesn't swim away. And if you try to grab it a tail, it's just gonna swim. But that's confusing. You're swimming fast, you're trying to aim for a face and boop, you might get a little bit of the tail but at least the fish can then use its shape to navigate into a very tight spot so that you can't chase it. So there are quite a, a few animals that actually have false colors to trick predators. Pretty cool. All right, maybe we have a couple more animals just to show you. Oh, you might recognize this one. This is a pallet tang. In fact, I think the last time we counted, there were over 10 different what we call common names. Because this animal is found throughout the Pacific Ocean in these nice warm locations, there are many people that have, uh, that are, you know, that have them in their own reefs called them something different. So you might know them as powder blue tangs or, um, you know, these palette tangs. There's quite a few names for them. Uh, but what's really striking is the coloration, right? So this is another type of what we call surgeon fish. And that is because right there, you might not see it, it's this tiny little line, is actually a very sharp barb. It's hard for us to see, but other animals are gonna find it really quickly. And I'm gonna tell you why. D these are pretty colors for us, but you see how there's this big wedge of yellow? That is a warning sign for other animals. They immediately see that and go, whoa, wait a minute. Maybe I should pay attention. This animal's trying to show me something. And there you go, right at the very end of that triangle shape is a barb that can actually stick out and it is very, very sharp. If you were to try to even grab this fish and pull it, it would injure your hand. Same thing for a predator's mouth. That fish is swimming, it's gonna have that really sharp barb to help defend it as the animal tries to close in. So instead of trying to blend in or hide where its eye is, it kind of is actually a little bit here, what it's mostly doing is saying, hey, <laughs> don't mess with me. I have a weapon I wouldn't taste very good. Uh, I think that's really awesome. 
when we were looking earlier, we saw a cousin to it that was also a surgeon fish. That was the one with the bristles on its mouth. It also had actually a little um, spike on it. Now, we can find a spike here. There's a lot of tropical fish that have little defense mechanisms like this. There's an angel fish. Angel fish um, are beautiful. Uh, they have a spike right here on their gill opening. So this is called their operculum here. So this part here is, sorry, this part right here is hard and it covers where they breathe out of. And it has this extra special weapon right here. You'll also notice those same kind of color patterns, right? Blue and yellow. Blue and yellow saying, watch out. <laughs> Don't mess with me. Um, you're not going to enjoy having this stuck inside your mouth. So yes, beautiful animal, bright colors. Uh, colors can communicate different things on a coral reef. So we've introduced you to some of the really incredible animals that live inside a coral reef. And I, we just talked about, what, three or four? And really there are, again, hundreds and hundreds because there's, there's good food, there are places to hide, places to raise your babies, all because of these um, reef building corals in here, which is absolutely amazing. I did want to tell you a little bit about a couple programs going on now. Um, coral reefs are facing a lot of challenges around the world. They're facing challenges because of climate change. And one of the big reasons, let me, let's take a step back here. So what's going on with climate change? Well, we said that our, our oceans, in order for our coral to grow, have to be nice and warm. But they do like a, a kind of a specific temperature range to be very happy in. If it gets too hot, or too cold, they really don't do very well. It stresses them out. In fact, if it gets too warm, remember those zooxanthellae, those little algaes? They actually leave. And that's because they're trying to find cooler water. They don't do so well in warm water. And climate change is causing that. When we have rampant release of carbon dioxide, when we burn fossil fuels like gas and coal, it releases it into our atmosphere and it creates what we call like a heat trapping blanket around the planet. So have you ever been like really warm, it's getting warmer <laughs> where I'm living, and you fall asleep and you forget to take that blanket off and you wake up and you're like, oh my goodness, I am really, really warm. Well, carbon dioxide is, cr is creating that pretty much around our planet. And places that get warm are getting even warmer. And it's creating um, problems for the coral. The other way that it's creating a problem is as there are as there is extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it is being absorbed by our ocean and changing the chemistry of our ocean. And when that happens, it takes away the building blocks, that calcium that we talked about, that the coral needs to grow. And that can be problematic, right? So all of those shelled animals out there need calcium to make calcium carbonate. That's the, their building block um, when we absorb extra carbon dioxide into our atmosphere, it is making it harder for it to be available. It's changing the chemistry. Um, so there are groups out there that are trying to help rebuild the coral. So unsustainable fishing practices, so basically um, fishing practices that drag nets over coral can be a problem. Oh, do you remember those little fish that I said that help balance it out? Yeah overfishing in areas that take away those little fish or any kind of unbalance in the food web can also be a problem. So to help us fight some of these challenges, there are teams out there that are trying to rebuild our coral reef systems. And what's really interesting is we have a, a team from the aquarium, our aquarists that take care of our tropical exhibits that are part of a program called Seacore and our aquarists who specialize in growing coral will fly out and partner with um, people in different countries, universities, for example, in Guam, that are experimenting on regrowing and repopulating the reef. What are we looking at right here? Well, turns out that coral is very picky on where it decides to grow. And that makes sense, right? Because it doesn't move <laughs> once it makes that choice. 
And it usually starts on a rock or another piece of coral that maybe has died. And it wants to have enough sunlight. So what, they've what they have found is they can actually go out when coral is ready to reproduce and they go out into a big spawning event, what they call. So um, eggs and sperm are released at the same time from the coral. Scientists can, um, can help recreate that by in a lab so that it's a controlled environment and they can help those little baby corals settle, give them opportunity to settle on something. They've created what we call our tetrapods here. And I think I have an example with me. It is made of a material that the baby corals really like and they can settle on this. And because it's mobile, we can move it. Once the coral starts to grow to a certain size, we can put, I say we, the, the scientists who are in these um, locations in different parts of the world that are helping to regrow, they can place these tetrapods out into the coral reef as kind of like a little jump start. Because they are grown in the lab, we know that they're nice and healthy um, and they might do a little bit better when they're placed out in these coral reefs that might need a little bit of help. And so that's really exciting. We might um, in the future be able to start growing coral that's a little bit more resilient to temperature changes. And so again, that might be something that's, that's pretty exciting as well. So there are lots of really great efforts out there um, to help study coral and see how they might do, not only for our changing climate, um, but also from some of these other practices that are not so great for coral reefs. Some things that you can do. Well, because we were learning about climate change, even though these, these beautiful corals are in places that are far away from us, that doesn't mean we don't have an impact on them. Reducing our carbon footprint plays a huge role, not only for coral reefs, but for animals in many different kinds of habitat. So reducing our um, electricity use, um, how, we, how much we drive our cars, so carpooling, things like that, voting, making sure that we're, we're picking sustainable choices as we vote. Um, so there are a lot of different ways in our communities and also individually that we can play a role for uh, mitigating climate change and also thinking about more sustainable ways that we, we fish in our oceans. All right, looks like we've run out of time. Uh, it's been fun exploring coral reefs, the animals, and some of, those, um, some of those ways that we can protect our coral reefs. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.